bit, and uh, we'll be releasing a, an adult bald eagle. Uh, for for how many of you is this your very first Wildlife Center eagle release? First timers. Ooh, that's good. That's good. All right, now just to give you a little perspective, how many of you have seen five or more? See, we've got a little cult that follows us around. <laughs> and we can probably go up 10, 15, I, I think. Uh, how many of you seen, Lona? <laughs> yeah, because we, we had one person who, who ha doesn't show up very much anymore, but she stopped counting at about 24 or 25. This is my 26th. And, you know, I, I think I'm the only one that had been to more than she. So, uh, in any case, um, it, it's nice to have you with us. Everyone's a little different. Everyone's special. And uh, today, boy, what a spectacular day. And the, the trees are giving us some good protection from the wind. So we, we expect a pretty good... Um, pretty good turnout. For those of you who are first timers at an Eagle release or who may uh, be, be visiting our uh, friends here at Kip Peak State Park, uh, we, we welcome you and uh, tell you a little bit about the, the Wildlife Center. We, we are a nonprofit organization. We're not your tax dollars at work. Uh, we're a teaching and research hospital for wildlife medicine. So in addition to caring, this year our patient load is way down, so probably only about 25, 2600 animals will come through our hospital this year, but uh, more importantly, we also are training veterinary students from every vet school in the United States and Canada, and both students and professionals from about 35 to 40 other countries who come to our facility in Waynesboro to learn about wildlife medicine, learn about conservation and environmental health. So when we get a bird like the one we're going to release today, this bird uh, was brought in, let's see, where'd Jay go back? Yeah. Where's our local expert over here? Uh, our Eastern Shore Rehabilitation Contingent who found this bird, or at least recovered this bird, brought it in. When we get a bird like this, the, the initial reports uh, didn't have anything obvious. Not bleeding, not found in the middle of the road. You know, we just don't know what's wrong. So when we... Uh, are able to get the bird stabilized here, transported to us by our able Eagle Taxi operators here. We've got several of our transporters here who uh, really make the trip pretty regularly from Virginia Beach all the way up to the valley. And that's a, it's about a seven hour round trip under normal circumstances. So that's a great deal of commitment. And so when we get these animals uh, that come in with without obvious causes of injury, that's where our veterinary team's expertise really comes into play. We've got four full-time wildlife veterinarians on the staff of the Wildlife Center, and we're open seven days a week, and somebody's on call 24-7 for emergency cases. In this case, physical exam showed nothing. Bird, uh, what we, uh, the, the technical term we use is ADR ain't doing right. <laughs> and so the bird uh, had ADR, a uh, bad case of ADR, but uh, the, there was nothing on the physical exam that made it obvious. They felt something funky in the radius, one of the two bones in the forewing of the bird. X-ray showed that it at one time had been broken, healed up, old injury, not a factor. So blood work, we honestly expected to find that this bird had been lead poisoned because hunting season's underway now and that's one of the most common injuries or I guess uh, uh, problems that we say. Not, again, it is an injury, it's a uh, toxic attack if you will, but one of the most common things we see and, and we are finding it all over the place and a lot of, uh, there's a lot of controversy about the continued use of lead projectiles and sport hunting and, and the there really there's a lot of misinformation about it. Suddenly everybody's talking about eagles and other birds uh, being poisoned and a lot of the, the pro-gun activists are saying oh it's just an attempt to get our guns we never heard about this 20 years ago. Well the reason was 20 years ago we didn't have the ability to test for it. Now in the Wildlife Center it takes us about 90 seconds take a little bit of blood test for it we can tell immediately whether an animal coming in has a higher than normal or a higher than healthy level of lead in its blood. Now we understand what lead does to humans. I mean, we had a big campaign to stop using lead paint because of the damage uh, it was doing to children, to young children, gnawing on the windowsill, chewing on the, the railing on the crib, getting those fragments of lead paint. We banned lead shot for waterfowl hunting in the United States 
uh, gosh, 20 years ago now. Yeah. And that was because we were losing an estimated 4 million birds, ducks, oh, no. geese, other types of waterfowl every year to toxicity because they ate a lead pellet. That's what we thought we'd find, but that's not what we found in this bird. What we found were the <laughs> symptoms of what we think must have been either a biological neurotoxin, a, bio, a biological or bacterial, excuse me, infection, or some type of pesticide, but the chemical itself was gone from the body. Only the effects remained behind. And so based on that, we treated the bird as if it had been pesticide poisoned and it did in fact recover. Now, had the bird not been recovered and transport, transported to us, uh, it never would have survived because at the wildlife center, it went for quite a while before it would even eat on its own. It was flying, it was doing all sorts of normal eagle stuff, but it wouldn't eat. And so they had to literally catch it and force feed it every day until its strength came back. It was bright, it was alert, it was looking otherwise normal, but somewhere in there, the wires were still muddled. And so had we not really intervened with this animal, this is one of the ones that would not be a success story. So we're lucky. We're lucky to have colleagues here on the Eastern Shore who can get these animals working with the, the veterinary professionals over here to get them stabilized, get them in a condition where they can make the trip. We're very fortunate to have people who will take their time on their own dime and transport animals. If any of you all would like to get involved in that, we can always use transporters from Eastern Shore. It seems like we uh, pretty much need a pipeline these days. Uh, how many eagles have we gotten over here this year? Now it's about eight. Yeah. Uh, more, more eagles have come from the Eastern Shore this year than probably in the last 10 years combined. I've, I've never seen so many eagles from here end up with us, nor have I made this trip over here quite so <laughs> If we could just tell them to fly on home, that'd be all right. But um, in any case, before I, let me see, any questions about things so far? Well, the eight eagles that you found and found here, what was the common cause? Uh, well, we've, actually there is no single cause. Uh, I released three birds up at uh, Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, two had been babies found in a, uh, on the ground when the tree that held the nest blew over in a campground. So uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, intervened, picked them up, brought them in, and the reason we were especially anxious to bring those in and then get them back is when we released those birds, they had tracking devices we, we had attached to them uh, because they're doing an awful lot of study on the migration of eagles along the coastline. Uh, as I'm sure some of you know, this area is heavily targeted for the development of wind energy. And uh, can you just imagine, as we came off the tunnel, uh, there were just thousands of birds, the big flock of yeah. vultures circling around and mm -hmm. some kind of swallows. I'm not sure, uh, not sure what they were. Some of, some of you birders can probably tell me. And the, the Sharpies and the Cooper's hawks flying around like crazy. Can you imagine mm -hmm. if we had a couple dozen of those big 150 foot wide turbines cranking away there like a big blender for birds? And it's, uh, you know, we, we have to be very careful when we seize on environmental issues and say, okay, we need green energy. Uh, we need to stop using oil. We need wind energy. Well, wind energy isn't necessarily better. It depends on where you put the facilities. Location, 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 because it has a consequence. There's no free ride. And that's one of the reasons that we're involved in not only documenting what happens to these animals, but exactly where. They are found exactly where they're returned and working with state and federal agencies. In the case of the birds we released up there, uh, actually with tracking devices on them. So you can go to our website, the Wildlife Center's website, wildlifecenter.org, and there's a, a link there so you can see on the map exactly where these birds are. Uh, these little devices report in every 48 hours, and the two birds we released at Chincoteague in, in August have already been up in Delaware and they vacationed up there on the beach and then they came on back and worked for a while and then they went someplace else. And it really is amazing that these birds never having flown in the wild, not a single day until we turned them loose that day. 
immediately went off and started doing Eagle stuff. Uh, it's hardwired into their genes. And uh, one of the things that it has proven, a lot of folks, uh, particularly a lot of the more conservative traditional wildlife biologists said, oh, wildlife rehabilitation is a waste of time. Those animals get turned loose and they go off and die because they don't know how to be wild. Well, guess what? They're wrong. Uh, they didn't go off and die, they went off and did eagle stuff and are doing just what they're supposed to do. And it, it's so uh, enjoyable for us, one of our uh, very close friends and colleagues, uh, a raptor biologist with the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and uh, he was one of those ones that just snorted every time we had talked about releasing these birds, <laughs> raised in captivity, and oh, it's never, it's never going to survive. And boy, he's eating those uh, words a dozen times over and we serve them up to him every time he comes to the Senate. So, anyway, all right, well what we're going to do here, before we, before we go any further, any questions yet? All right, that's a good answer. Um, before I forget, after the eagle release, a, a very important wildlife center tradition is we bring cookies. And we've got cookies, so we'll have cookies over there uh, on the table under the edge of the shelter when we're done. Hey there. Just for a cookie. Really? What y'all are seeing this bird, what y'all have done for this bird, we're the ones that found him actually. My husband, um, he sent a picture. The bird was standing upright in a field by the northern landfill in Atlantic. And he took a picture. The bird was standing upright. You could drive the tractor right up from here to the van. He would not move. He would just stand there. By the time I got home from the bird, Probably around 5:30, a couple hours later. Oh, he took me to the field to show me the eagle. He was laying down, face. He was hiding his had his wing out. His face was under the wing, like he was trying to hide the best he could to defend himself. And you could see he was still breathing. And I took a picture and I with my phone, and it made the noise droid when you take the picture. And he just opened his eyes and looked up, but he was on his way out. Yeah, he certainly was. And then we. My husband made phone calls, several people, because we'd never been involved in finding anything like this. We didn't know who to call where to start, so we jumped through hoops with phone numbers and finally got short wildlife rehab. And by the time she got there, it was a couple hours later, and it was dark, and we went back to the field. And at that time, you couldn't even tell the bird was alive. You couldn't see him breathing and pick him up, and its head would just dangle. I mean, it was just like a dead bird. Yeah. And she took him and did the IVs. And then y'all got him, and now he's going to be released. Uh, he's going to be released as well. Well, I will tell you that we don't get to save every animal that comes to our door, but if people like this don't care enough to try and to get involved, we don't save any. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And so we, we applaud your efforts. Thank you so much for doing that. And I had not heard that story before, so that gets me the same way it does you, I promise you. All right, any other questions? Thank you for sharing that. that that's very important. Please. How old is this bird? Uh, it's over five, uh, but beyond that, we don't know. Uh, it's an adult bird. They, they don't get mature coloration until they're four and a half years old. So right now, the birds that are uh, four and three quarters years old at this point are just now coming into their adult plumage. Uh, they, they, they were kind of modeled, they start off dark and then they gradually change kind of the configuration. But by the time they enter their fifth year, uh, which would be in February and March when they, they're typically hatched here in Virginia, uh, then they have their adult coloration. Beyond that, we don't know. The only time we're able to really tell is if they happen to have been banded when they were juveniles. And in the record, if whoever banded them filled out the records properly, we can tell how old they were, when they were banded, and then just do a little math. Uh, we have had birds uh, come to the Wildlife Center with bands that had been banded as chicks. That, uh, in fact, one bird I remember distinctly was 27 years old. And 27 years later, uh, this one came from over on Northern Neck, it was found five miles from its original nest, at which it had been banded. Which is, you know, it just tells us it matters. Habitat matters. Questions? Any other things for? Yes, please. Male or female? Uh, it, I'm guessing I'm, I'll be able to tell a little better when I get it out, but I think this is a male. He's a pretty small bird. Females are bigger, uh, about a third larger, a lot more assertive. <laughs> I, I don't think I chose my words as carefully last time. 
but uh, they, females are definitely the, the more powerful in most of the birds of prey. Uh, most, most hawks, owls, eagles, whatever, uh, the females are larger. What did he have for breakfast? Uh, he did not have any breakfast yet, and the reason for that is he was fed yesterday and then put into the cage. So when I get him out, for those of you who have been to these things many times, I'm going to hold him and I'll walk him around a little bit to uh, be able to... Uh, let's see. Oh, that's a march hawk or a uh, harrier. Eastern harrier. Or northern harrier, not eastern harrier. Northern harrier. They're neat birds. They're, uh, they're one of the ones that will fly along a field after... Like if you see them over a cornfield, I get them out near my place, and they literally will go up and down the rows, and then they'll turn and come down the other row. <laughs> and, and just precisely, it's moving so Shopping. slowly, you can hardly tell. But you can always tell the northern harrier by that big white rump pack right at the base yeah. of its tail. Very, very neat birds. Their eyes, unlike most hawks that have eyes on the side, their eyes are around in the front. They look very much like, um, like an owl in the face, because they're hunting on the ground, low to the ground unlike hawks that are hunting in the air are, are much higher. Neat birds. Okay, any other questions? Does he have a name? Uh, nope, we got a number. He, he's, he's been a prisoner, so uh, he's, he's got, a, got a number, not a name. I think that was Bruce Hornsby's song. Uh, Secret <laughs> agent man. Okay, the, the question for those of you who may not have heard, is there any issue with imprinting about the, them being rehabilitated, being around humans, um, the, the answer is there can be a problem with very, very young birds. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that when we get very, very young eagles in, we will always try, pardon me, to put them with other eagles and to uh, have them. We, in fact, we have a huge aviary that is specifically designed for baby eagles because it has a nest platform in it. It's a balcony that sticks out into this cavernous, uh, this, this cage is 20 some feet tall, about 16 feet wide and 85 feet long and right in the middle there's a balcony that sticks out and when we get young eagles we put them on that balcony in a fake nest and then put older eagles in the cage so they grow up around it. But uh, you probably seen on uh, TV or, or in magazines where they'll use puppets to feed baby birds. Um, that's, that's the case. We very seldom get them in that are so young that we have to resort to that. Most of the ones that we get are already past the imprinting stage. But, but it's a good question and it is a problem. But as you will see, I'm quite confident, uh, this, this bird like has no affinity for humans at all. I'll be lucky to get away unscathed. No, no. <laughs> the, uh, I, I have, I've had them um, uh, do damage to me, shall we say, while trying to release them. This bird uh, was found on September 17th, got to us on September 18th, so just over a month. This thing recovered very, very quickly, but again, never would have made it. Would not have made it another 48 hours, uh, I'm sure, had it not gotten to decay and been given the fluids to rehydrate it, uh, help it stabilize a little bit, and then transport it immediately to us. What was All your right. cost to save him? The cost to save him, that, that's a pretty interesting question, because if you look at fair market value, so if, if you've got a dog that's 10 pounds and you take it and board it at the vet, healthy dog, it's going to cost you about, what, $20 a day? Or more. $25 a day? Oh, yeah, people are going rolling their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's say $30 a day. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're looking at that just for housing. And then the bird was treated by veterinary professionals every single day. And every time you take an animal to a veterinarian just for an office call, it's 40 to $50. Just to have the vet cast his or her eyes on the animal. It went through full and repeated laboratory and diagnostic testing several times. Uh, it went through full radiography several times. And so ultimately, now obviously a lot of this stuff is absorbed into our operating budget, but the value of the care we gave to this animal was probably $2,500 to $3,000 in the last 30 days. So, and that would be, I, I would say that's relatively conservative because if you take an animal to a referral practice where there's a specialist, 
which I've got to do with one of my cats lately, so I can tell you it's expensive. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, that, that's a rough estimate. That's that's a question I don't get very often. Thank you for asking. That. <laughs> this is a different one. All right. Any other questions? All right. Now, what what's going to happen next? And I'm, I'm going to get pretty focused on things here so that nobody gets hurt, least of all me. Uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, put on gloves. I will get the evil out of the cage, and then I'm going to get some help and take the gloves off. Now the reason I take the gloves off is because I am able, once the bird is under control, I'm able much more effectively to maintain control. Holding his feet, holding him around the neck so that he doesn't turn around and give me a kiss goodbye. <laughs> As has happened before on live television. Well actually it wasn't live television, but uh, releasing a bird in Prince William County, Virginia, up near DC. Uh, CBS Channel 9, WUSA had a cameraman there right in my face and I'm by myself and it was a great big female being very, very assertive <laughs> and I'm worried about her feet because her feet were like this and they have 500 pounds of pressure per square inch and I was about to lose my grip on her feet which becomes body piercing <laughs> and uh, especially shall we say down there. Oh, in regions below the chest, that becomes an area of great sensitivity. And while I'm trying to control their feet, she reached up and bit me on the cheek and tore off a great big piece of skin, and the blood just flew on the cameraman's love. <laughs> so that got picked up by the network. <laughs> and I was getting all these helpful suggestions from my friends around the country. You shouldn't put your face in their mouth. <laughs> so, so we're going to work hard to avoid that today. All right, but once, once we get the bird out, uh, I'm going to release it just out there on the other side of the horseshoe pit, and we'll get people to form a semicircle. I'm going to shoot it across, well, I mean, probably not a good choice of words. I'm going to propel the bird into freedom that away. And so we'll want people to kind of be, give us a sort of a semicircle or a horseshoe. Now before I turn it loose, because it's been in this cage since uh, yesterday afternoon, I'm going to hold it for a while and I will walk around so you can get a close-up photograph, if you would like, giving its eyes a chance to adjust to this very bright sunlight. We don't want to turn it loose, have it become <laughs> Sun blind and fly into the side of a tree someplace. Yeah, we'll go All right. Back home again. All right. Okay, troops, you ready? All right. And uh, Uber volunteer Linda Vetter hey, is Linda. Uh, here. Uh, she's uh, from the Virginia Beach area. Is a licensed uh, or permitted wildlife rehabilitator and one of our apprentices actually at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. So she's worked with uh, our, our birds up there. And Patty behind the GoPro. And Mandy, the cookie queen, uh, are here. They are students at the Wildlife Center and uh, learning uh, to save lives and do all that good stuff. All right. Ready? Oh yeah, this is a male. He's a little bird. Aww. Little bird. Little small to be an adult female. And doesn't have much to say. All right. All right, let's go out here and form our semicircle. All right, so you're good. Um, okay, now I'm going to wait for the wind to die down a little bit. Optimistic. 
Ah, look at that. Yeah. <laughs>